the uh, shofars today is going to do a, a wail. And it's actually very fitting for the ninth of Av. But it's also very fitting for Yahweh's voice. And as we'll, we'll talk about, this is a week of Pei Zadi. It's not Pei, that was last week. And next week will be Zadi. So this week is Pei Zadi. Which literally as a word means open mouth. And the reason, if we, as, as you go through all the various weeks of what we've been talking about, the reason for the wailing of Israel in all these events that happened on the ninth of Av is because they refused to take heed to Yahweh's words as he called out to them. And so today we're going to read through many verses, but for the shofar blast, it's basically this wail. And, and remember, Yahweh didn't want this stuff to happen to his people. So picture Yahweh's voice as wailing, not just our wailing, but our response of being here, studying these words, regarding his voice. It's our voice asking him to stop what's been going on and help, help us to come back to him. So this is just the... Uh, Picture his voice and our voice in these uh, two voices of the shofar. And again, this one, like the pillar of fire, pillar of smoke, and this is the, the ram's horn of uh, his presence among our, us. And if you read about the blowing of the shofar, not only on the day of Yom Teruah, which literally doesn't mean the day of trumpets, it means the day of blowing. Teruah is blowing. Um, there are... I think there's four or five different times when it says you should blow the shofar. So just before I blow them, I'll, I'll mention what they are. If you read it in, I think it's in Exodus or Leviticus, uh, excuse me, I don't, uh, didn't prepare for this one, but I looked at it one time saying, what's the big deal about blowing a shofar? I heard one person say, well, there's this speculation that the demons, when they hear the shofar, they think, what? Is that Messiah coming back? We better get out of here. And so they run. It's like, well, whether or not they do that, that's... But Yahweh's voice sounded like a shofar blast getting louder and louder and louder on the, at the time of, on Mount Sinai when he was speaking and giving the commandments of the covenant of the Brit to Israel. And so it re, we remember that. And you could say, well, when Yeshua was born, the heavens opened up and the angels were singing and proclaiming. There could have been trumpets there. Whether or not they were blowing trumpets, we have to remember that he was born either on Yom Teruah, the day of blowing of trumpets, in which case there would have been trumpets, or he was born on the first day of Sukkot, and we're supposed to blow the trumpets at the festival, so there would have been blowing of trumpets the day that he was born. He wasn't born on Christmas. But then he also says, blow the trumpets on, and the word is that which goes up. Well, it's translated burnt offering. Burnt offering is that offering which just goes up in smoke. But it, it doesn't say burnt offering. It says that which goes up. So you could say, if I want to lift up my request unto him, that's what goes up. And remember, the pay lines up with the altar of incense in the Mishkan pattern. And the, the, the smoke, the fumes of the incense goes up and it says it comes before his throne, which are the prayers of the saints, which to him are a sweet smelling savor. So incense goes up, the, the, the prayers of not the saints, it's actually Kadoshim, which is the set apart ones. It's like whatever goes up or whatever in, in terms of our thanks offerings, and I think there was a couple other occasions. But the interesting thing about that is it says, blow the shofar at these various occasions and it will be a voice of remembrance for you. So what he's saying is, Israel, I've given you this tool. Whenever you do something, which is what he said to do, blow the shofar. And, I, and, I, and he said, well, why would you do that? It's kind of like if every time, I think I used this illustration once before, but if every time, say you had a kid who you want him to take out the trash, and he doesn't want to, but every time he takes out the trash, he goes, he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Every day he takes out the trash and he goes, takes out the trash again. And finally one day he says, 
hey, can I go see this movie? And you go, no, we don't have the guard or the money or the time for that. And then he goes, and you go, oh. and remember, every time he did something that you wanted him to do, and he goes, go, that's right. Tell you what, now I will step out of what I want to do and I'll do something that you want to do. We're assuming all things being equal that there's no other problems with him going to want to see that movie. You see, this little knock is the voice of remembrance. It's not, it, so Yahweh said whenever we do something that he asked us to do, blow the shofar. And then, and this is the critical thing, when your enemies besiege you, like all these events on the ninth of Av, he said, you blow that shofar, and that voice of remembrance will capture my ear, and I will come with a vengeance upon your enemies. The whale. So here's Pezadi. So the reason for Pezadi, why we're having a week of a Selah, where we're joining two letters together, is we've been having the Selahs at the veils, the breaks, the obstructions within the Mishkan pattern. So Vav Zion, so you start with Aleph, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Aleph, Hey, Vav Zion. Zion is a weapon that cuts off. Chet is a fence. The fence, the Mishkan fence, was made out of white linen, had blue, purple, red embroidery. It was a gate, it was a fence, it was a veil that kept anybody from walking in unless you were either clean or if you'd been in contact with the dead, you had the red ashes of the red heifer washed over you by the priest outside the fence, so you were allowed in. So this fence, the four-colored door of the Mishkan, was a veil, essentially. That's a Chet. So between Zion and Chet, we had a Selah. Selah means a suspension in the music. Stop and think about it. Then inside the fence, of course the fence in the Mishkan pattern is the equivalent of Chet, Tet, and Yod. And then the altar of sacrifice lines up with Kaf, Lamed. The labor lines up with Mem, Nun. Those are all on the outside, but then you've got the covered place. So the three letters inside the Kadosh place is Samet, Ayin, Pei. But there's a fence, that's the covered place. So there's a veil, again, an embroidered door, between Noon and Samak. So we had a break at Noon Samak, a Selah. And we talked about Noon Samak being the emblem, this little embroidered emblem here of the Noon, of the, the Noon, which is a living one, on a Samak, which is a trellis or a proper and engineered structure. So it's a picture of Yeshua on the stake or the serpent lifted up that all who has been bit should look at him and live, surrounded by the other letters which is kind of like the hub of a wheel, which is the meaning of the word Ahasuerus, which is the king's name of Esther. So even in the book of Esther, where Yahweh's name is never mentioned, even in the king's name, it's the same picture as this image. And there was more about that that we talked about on the uh, week of the noon Samic. I'll go back over that in a few minutes. But then after, between the, uh, the pay, which lines up with the altar of incense, right? So inside the Kadosh place, you've got the menorah, lines up with the Samic. The table of showbread lines up with the ayin, and the altar of incense lines up with the pay. Again, pay, mouth, prayer, fellowship, talking, communication, singing. These are all mouth events. But there was this veil, and on the other side of the veil, the only thing inside there was the Ark of the Covenant, lines up with the Zadi. So here's the, we're now at the veil between the pay and the Zadi, this is the word Pezadi. So there's a lot of interesting things about this word, which we'll try to get into. 
But to just show you where we're going to try to go here, I mentioned last week that we're going to talk about Psalm 119. So did, did everybody read Psalm 119 this week? Did anybody read Psalm 119 this week? I tried to get Jamie to send out an email to, to remind everybody, and a few people forgot, and people didn't have time, and it's like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. But the reason I asked is that if you read Psalm 119, it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. And there's a certain format that Psalm 119 uses. It's actually the word Tehillim is the word Psalm. And um, there's, in some English Bibles they talk about it and some they don't. So I'm going to show you the structure of Psalm 119, but we're not going to get to Psalm 119 until the second half, an hour from now. So for this first hour, I'm going to talk to you about Hazadi business. So that when we get to Psalm 119, you can appropriate this Pezzotti concepts to Psalm 119. So I'll show you this, the format of Psalm 119 so that maybe you could be thinking about it as I go through some of this Pezzotti stuff. The first letter being Aleph, there's eight words starting with Aleph, right? But each word is a word. So you might say, well, the first word here happens to be Ashri. It's the first word of the sentence. Well, there's eight verses, all starting with the letter Aleph as the first letter of the first word. So Ashri is the first word of the first verse of Psalm 119. In the second verse, the first word of that whole line of words is also Ashri. So forth and so on. Those two happen to match, but there's eight words that start with the letter Aleph. Each verse in the first eight verses start with the letter Aleph. The next eight verses all start with a word that starts with the letter Bet. Oh, I have a list of those words. I didn't get them printed up for you, but you can, if you have a Tanakh, you can see them, but we'll talk about them in the second hour. Same with Gimel, Dalit, Hey, Bob, so forth and so on. Now, if you read in English, some Bibles don't even mention it, but some Bibles will tell you, oh, this is the Aleph section, this is the Bet section, this is the Gimel section, and so forth. And you might think, oh, well, it's just chronologically going through the alphabetic sequence. So I, I posed last week as perhaps a riddle to say, would David possibly, in the remotest thinking about David, would he have hidden a riddle, a puzzle, in anything that he wrote? Would he? Maybe? Speculatively? Okay, so let's suppose he didn't. Okay, then whatever we're going to do with Psalm 119 is bogus, right? It just doesn't matter, we're just playing around. But what if he did? Well, then maybe there's something there to find. If David, in verse 18, I think it is, he says, you have shown me the mysterious wonders in your Torah. Mysterious wonders? The word is pele, paleo. Actually, the word paleo means wonderful, marvelous, mysterious, amazing, astonishing. So the fact that we're studying paleo Hebrew, paleo isn't just a Latin and Greek word that means ancient. It also means, in Hebrew, astonishing, wonderful, marvelous, incredible Hebrew. That's why we're studying Paleo-Hebrew and not just Phoenician or Proto-Sinaitic or Proto-Canaanite, which is also what this ancient form of writing has been called. So you could sit there and say, well, let's, there's another verse, I think it was in Psalms 118, the previous chapter, where David said, this is so, I'm paraphrasing, he says, this is so great I ask you to show me your wonderful mysteries, and you did. You answered me. It's like, really? David asked to see something hidden, mysterious, wonderful, astounding, and he got an answer? Now, here's some more speculation. Would somebody like David have kept it to himself, or would he have told everybody? He might have kept it to himself. He might not have showed it or written it down, in which case, 
any, any other study we do is bogus, it's all speculation, and it's like, so what? But, but maybe he did. If David found something wonderful, marvelous, some great treasure in Yahweh's word, where might he have found it? Remember, in David's time, most of the Bible hadn't been written yet. The Torah had been written, maybe the book of Judges, Joshua, but that's about it. Certainly not Kings and Chronicles or the writings or anything else. So it's like David had very little scriptures to regard, basically the Torah and then some chronological chronology chronicles of the kings. I'm using that word to show you the play on words because it's all about words, right? Where or what do you suppose David might have found if he found a wonderful, amazing, marvelous mystery? Where would he have found it hidden in the Torah? After after all, remember, I'm trying to goad your thinking here. The Torah is simply a listed history. This is what was in the beginning. This is how the earth was created. This is what happened in the Garden of Eden. This is what happened with Noah. This is what happened after Noah. This is Abraham. This is how Abraham brought forth Isaac and Yaakov and Joseph goes to Egypt and brought forth the three million or 600,000 men plus strangers who came out of Egypt and went into Sinai and this is how they got the Ten Commandments and then they were given judges to rule over them but they flipped out and they went this way and that way and every once in a while they walked on the straight path but other than that suddenly David's born. Okay, there's a narrative story of the, of the Torah. What in there got David so jazzed? Does anybody know? Why should David have been exhilarated about finding something? What did he find? Anybody got any clues? Anybody? Do you want to just raise your hand and, and say, what do you suppose David was looking for other than just the history of his people, what do you suppose David found? Two questions. And having found it, where would he have hidden it? Did anybody have any guesses? I'm getting all the spirit. The spirit? He found the spirit? The heart of Yahweh. The heart of Yahweh. Where would he have found it? In the Torah. And how do you find the heart of Yahweh in the Torah? I think he found it in the music. I think when he was, um, I think when he was in the shepherd's field, he would. It, stories of, are that he would play his the lyre, and it would settle the sheep. And I think in the playing of music to the sheep, I think he tapped into the the heart of the Creator through music, and that opened up his heart to hear the voice of Yah. Okay, so if that was so, then. He may have, the question would be, he talks all through Psalm 119 about the Torah. Now, if he found a secret in music, of course, we know Len Horowitz has been studying with Dr. Emoto, talking about the, the, I think we mentioned once before, 528 Love is the the Len Horowitz's new book. He's in Hawaii. You can get it, I think, online. You can order it. And we've talked about this this incredible thing with the Solfeggio notes. Rico Cortez has done some tapes on the same matter. that may be true, but David is talking about finding something in the Torah. Did he find music in the Torah? David is responsible for having orchestrated or put together as a conductor all the singing and the instrumentation that would be then done around the Ark of the Covenant, around the Torah in the meeting place, you might say. And so you might say, well, what singing did they do before that? Well, they played shofars, and the, the priests would lead in singing as they would go out into battle. But did David find out about music in the Torah? I mean, maybe, but, but what I'm saying is, what did he find in the Torah that he might have regarded? Maybe he put the Torah to music. He might have done that. But if he was asking Yahweh, show me something, I got the words in front of my face, but... I know there's something else in here. Will you please show me? Then all of a sudden, I believe it's in Psalm 119, he says, wow, you showed me. And then Psalm 119, he writes this thing in alphabetic sequence. What do you suppose he might have found? What was he looking for? Um, Sandy, you had a, a point? Well, the thing I was thinking about, the reality that what I found in the Torah was myself. I, I, I found a connection link, a, a, a click, a switch. 
and, and I knew then that I was created by him and he was he was running my life. I found a home, I found a connection. So you found more than simply history or religion or doctrine. Personal. You, you found some personal connection within there. Okay, so on one hand, Sandy could tell us these things and we could say, well, if you were to write those down, it's kind of personal. It's almost like a personal diary. Well, where would you write them or why should you write them if it's personal? So the question is, relating back to David then, is what he found so personal? It was just like, well, David, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you uh, found something that did something for you. But... If you read Psalm 119, David is going on and on and on, the longest chapter in the entire Bible, about a certain subject matter. So it doesn't sound like it's that personal, but it sounds like his mission is a personal mission, which I'll get to in the second half. But Okay, so... Okay, so that's my speculation. It's the same as Gita's. Now, I can't prove to you that it's there, but did anybody hear what she said? No. Perhaps he found something else embedded in the words that was a deeper meaning of the words that was beyond the narrative. I heard someone explain it like this. When I first heard him explain this, I thought, gosh, this guy's missing something. He said... What if, it's all speculation, what if these words we have in the Torah, that the narrative isn't what's important? And I thought, well, narrative certainly is important. Why, those are Bible stories. Those tell us the information. The information is given to us through the vehicle of these words. Of course the Bible stories are important. No, you get off of that for a minute. Imagine if the words were suitcases carrying information. But people are not to be trusted. People will mess up the truth. People will hide or obfuscate or twist or distort the truth. But if you put the truth into suitcases and now make the suitcases sacred, they'll carry the suitcases very carefully through time, through thousands of years. And you may end up four, five, six thousand years later, with the suitcase intact. But it's not the suitcase that was so important, it's what's in the suitcase. And when I, when I first told this to me, I thought, nah, this guy, well, this, this guy happened to be uh, Stan Tennen, who's an astrophysicist, and he doesn't necessarily, at least when I talked to him a number of years ago on the phone, he's with a Miru organization, just for what it's worth. He's not, I wouldn't classify him as a believer, his name is at the bottom of the chart. His organization is M-E-R-U, and, and if anybody looks it up, you'll find some weird things there. Astounding things. And some things that you'll find that he has discovered are so mind-blowing, you almost have to be an astrophysicist to regard it. And it doesn't talk about the stories in the Torah. It talks about such esoteric things as geometric metaphors of consciousness embedded in the sequence of letters that are in Bereshit 1-1. The first letter, or the first verse of the Bible, he spent 30 years studying. And he wasn't reading the narrative. He wasn't read, reading, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He's not regarding who created it. He's looking at Bet Resh Aleph, Shin Yod Tav, Bet Resh Aleph, and so forth and so on. Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemim vayet Aretz. How do you spend 30 years? Just to show you where this can go, because see, this class is just the beginning. I'm just trying to give you an appreciation and an evaluation. So remember the word Eric, I, I and Reshkoff is to appropriate a value, to give an appraisal or regard. You know, you might look at something and say, what's this? Oh, it's just a rock. It was laying out in the field. Remember what Yeshua gave a couple parables. He said a guy found something and he realized its value. He went back and sold everything he had to buy the field. Maybe the field's for sale for $100,000. He sold everything he has to come buy the field because he knows that he, that rock that the treasury found in the field was worth $10 million. Do you know what you're seeing? Do you know what you're looking at? So Stan Tennant sits there and he finds this thing 
After 30 years, what he did, you see, Jamie's talked about the gematria value. Aleph is one, bet is two, gimel is three, dalek is four, hay is five, so forth and so on. He was studying for 20 years, and somebody says, hey, why don't you put those letters into base three and plot them on a Cartesian coordinate graph of X, Y, and Z axes? We've talked about the Z axes being that, the vertical, X and Y are like horizontal, unilateral, and that the word Yaakov literally means to jump up into the third axis, to cube something or to raise to the third power. So he did that. He took the, the, the letters in their sequence of Bet Resh Aleph, Shin Yod Tav, Bet Resh Aleph, Aleph Lamed, Hey Yod Mem, Aleph Tav, Hey, anyway. And he plots them and it forms a shape which happens to fit into your hand which looks like a seed which sprouts puts out a trunk bears a branch whose fruit is in it whose seed is within itself to procreate the next generation and he found that was a metaphor a geometrical model of consciousness and he goes into the light and the meeting tent and tetrahedrons and on and on and on and on and he found it to be a model that fits ancient cultural fables and folklore from india from china from greece from from all these other places and it's like is this true? Well, it also pushes into the astronomy of this, of a smoke ring, what he calls a torus, T-O-R-U-S, which is like this billowing smoke ring, and on it is a pattern of seven planes that intersect each other. It looks like the design on a tortoise back, and as I was talking to Mark earlier, there's this fable, this legend from India, that the world rests on the back of a tortoise. And you think, ah, oh, those crazy, you know, goofballs. It's like, no, wait a minute. What if they were actually remembering that this pattern that was in Bereshit 1-1 is that which the entire world is established on, which is the notion that in the beginning, Elohim barad, or, or created that et hashemam ve'et ha'aretz, the heavens and the earth. The whole world rests on that. And all they remembered because they spun out was that, gee, the world is on the back of a turtle. No, that's the imagery that turned into paganism and, and heathen mysticism that they lost because we lost the words of Yahweh. Anyway, you can look at more Miru stuff. This is just the beginning of many, many hours. Um, the, the thing to do, though, is to realize what did Yahweh give his people and why to give it to them? And just because we've lost it doesn't mean it can never be recovered. So people say, Gee, this, if the earth right now is on a fast, fast track of destruction, it's like being on a roller coaster that's out of control and the end of the track is washed out and we're, we're speeding downhill and the only thing left in front of us is to crash and burn. That, that's it. That's all we've got in front of us. And hopefully, Jesus will come back and rapture us out of the seats like seconds before the thing impacts. Right? Isn't that the blessed hope? I say that a bit facetiously, but it's not facetious. It's what we've been taught because this letter Zadi in the Mishkan pattern basically represents the hope set before us. And it's the letter we're going to talk about next week. And when I say the hope set before us, it's because within the Mishkan pattern, you've got essentially you're in the darkness, like on the chart. You're in the darkness and you choose life. You choose light. You choose to enter the chet. Oh, you can't. You have to deal with the Zion, the Vav Zion, the man slain or the, the guard at the gate so you can come in. And as soon as you come in, Kaf Lamed, you learn the instructions. Mem Nun, you're told to nurture them because they will bring forth, which is the promise, they're going to bring forth either blessing or cursing, the way you nurture and teach and learn the promises. So Kaf Lamed is learn the instructions. Mem Nun is nurture them to bring forth. Samachai and Pei is Shema Shomer, watch, keep, and guard, hear, believe, and do, and Pei all together one. Well, remember, Pei lines up with the festival of Sukkot. So the green shirt here, like the Pei, the color green, has to do with putting leafy branches over your sukkah, your temporary dwelling, and having a big party for a week. So I know people are planning Sukkot. I would, I would suggest that, you, that everybody remember Sukkot's a party. There's one commandment for Sukkot. So, so Yahweh Elohim doesn't want anybody to step out of line, especially at Sukkot. I mean, this is the sixth of seven festivals. It's the great festival of the year. It's the festival of it and gathering, and nobody better mess around. So he gave one authoritative command that we all better regard for Sukkot. And if you have any teachings at Sukkot, 
You better learn this one. I'm going to put it up here. The first two letters are Aleph Kaf. Now that we've learned Hebrew, does anybody know how to pronounce that? Ah! It's like, ooh, boy, that'll, that'll bring your attention. That's like a, and it, little, it literally is like a big exclamation point, and it means only. Aleph is the plan. Remember, Aleph is the plan that Abba purposed in his heart. And remember, Kaf is an open hand, which is, this is your gift. But open hand is also your covering. And so the Kaf is like these palm leaves or banana leaves, these covering leaves of your sukkah. Which is, so here's your gift, which is also your covering. And it also is like the lines of instruction of the Torah. So here is, this is only, you could read the Kaf as for you. Only for you? Well, this is like, you better regard this. Or it can mean, listen, the people of the world that don't regard Sukkot, they don't get this. This is only for you who regard the lines of my, the instructions of my Torah. It's like, all right, now what's this next word? Um, rats, I think it's a, I, I don't know if it's a psalmic or a shin. I think it might be a psalmic. Shin, mem, chet. Do you remember Dieter? Is that Samaic? Is that with a sheen or Samak? Samak. Samak. Now, does anybody know what that word means? Samak. Joy. Joy! It's, it, it's also translated rejoice. You see, Yahweh's commandment for Sukkot is, you shall only rejoice. Hallelujah. It's like, if you want to take a nap, you take a nap. If you want to talk with your friends, he says, you will buy, you'll save up actually your tithes, and you'll spend it on whatever your heart desires, and you'll bring it to Sukkot, you'll share with your friends, and you'll even bring strong drink. And you'll drink it at Sukkot. And the commandment is, if any one of you starts grumbling and griping about something, you better knock it off. So when I was, I was kind of being kidding when I was saying that, gee, this, this mean guy, he's given a commandment. Boy, sometimes, you know, when you're with your friends and your family for a week, <laughs> Yeah, things start getting a little close. But the point is, he said, your commandment for the week of Sukkot is you better rejoice. Only rejoice. Don't think about the news reports. Don't think about your finances. That's why you're supposed to save up your tithe for the year and spend it at Sukkot. It's party time, and no better buddy, nobody better be crying. Don't get sad at Sukkot. That's the commandment. Well, see, the pay lines up with the letter representing Sukkot. I don't know what's going on with it. Why is this here? Um, try that. So what I'm saying is that the pay is the mouth and it lines up with Sukkot. So you drink, you eat, you talk, you laugh, the open mouth, you laugh. Hilarious laughter, bright, shining, gleaming, is what Yitzhak's name means, Isaac. Yahweh's into us rejoicing in him in spite of what's going on around us in the world, in spite of what's happening in Israel, in spite of what's happening on the ninth of Av. We started this off with the wail, but remember, why were there wailings? Now, I don't know any of those people that have lived over the last 5,000 years, or even in the last century, but there was a lot of wailing going on, and I'm going to read some verses here that have to do with Pezadi, it tells us why that stuff happened. And again, I can't tell you, well, those, those guys are sinners. I'm not, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, Yahweh said, if we regard his words, he will answer when we cry and whoop the tar out of our enemies, you might say. Amen. However, if we disregard his words, and there's many verses that I've mentioned in the past of this class, and I've got them written down. We can go over them at some point. He says, if you plug your ears when I speak to you, I will plug my ears when you scream, because your enemies have come down upon you. Because had you listened, Shema, and regarded Shomer, my words, that wouldn't have happened you did it to yourself. 
through the injustice and the oppression of your fellows and your disregarding of my words as my gift to you. Okay, so I'm trying to set up everything I'm about to read with that. So I'm going to do things a little bit differently today because this is the Selah. So I'm not talking about a particular letter. I'm talking about Pezadi, which means open mouth. Now here's another interesting thing. And I'm just, you know, let me show you something about Isaac Moseson's book. Here's another book that he wrote. This was 1989, published again in 2000. This guy's done incredible research. 20,000 English words, he says, all came out of Hebrew. People can look at this. This is like a dictionary, then there's back, there's a whole glossary of words. The guy's checked a couple hundred different modern languages, and it's just astounding. He's the same guy that did the book that um, Jamie bought last week for people. There's a lot of English words that come directly out of Hebrew. Has anybody ever heard of the word putz? Does anybody know what it means? It's kind of an insult. Anybody know what it means? You could call it that. That's, that's a nice way to refer to it. Excuse me? Yeah. See, see, people have turned it into putzing around. But the, word, but the word actually is puttering, puttering around. I was talking to a friend the other day. It's like, has anybody ever noticed what sits in the front yard of the Vatican? Does anybody know? Huh? A big obelisk. Kind of like the Washington Monument. Does anybody know where that came from? Egypt. Egypt. Where in Egypt? Does anybody know which city it came from? I thought, I thought it was Heliopolis. Yes. Okay. Does anybody know what the word Heliopolis means? What's that? City of the sun. You see, it comes from Greek and Latin. Helio is sun. In Polis, where we get like metropolis or police, it's the people that guard the people, right? So it's the people. So it's the city of the sun people. You see, this obelisk was in Heliopolis, and it was out in front of their main temple of the sun god. This was the... Put it into a clinical term, it was the phallus of Ra, the sun god. And does anybody remember what Yahweh said to Israel when they came in and conquered the land of Canaan, what they were supposed to do with the idols? Destroy. Destroy them, turn them to dust, burn them, get rid of them. Well, around this, if you look at an aerial view, is eight spokes. And a wheel going around it, very similar to the pattern of the noon psalmic with the alphabetic letters going around it. You see, it's a representation of the sun deity. And I heard the Catholics basically say, hey, I think it was Napoleon that got this, if I have my history right. Napoleon conquered you know, Egypt, grabbed this obelisk, and brought it back and stuck it in front of the Vatican in their front yard as a lawn ornament and says, hey, look, we conquered the world. We conquered the great antithesis to the God of the Bible, and we've captured, kind of like playing captured the flag, right? We've captured their idol, their main obelisk, pointing up to their sun god, saying, we rule, it's kind of shaped like the Washington Monument, and now we bring it back and stick it in the front yard of the Vatican and say, look, we've conquered you. Does anybody know what the kings used to do when they conquered a city? They sat in the gates and they hung the, um, or killed the, the nobles of the city, right? They sat in the gates. There's this phrase, to sit in the gates is where judgment happens. And the conquering king sits in the gate of the conquered city and rules there. <laughs> Yahweh said to his people, when you conquer the four nations with their false deities, destroy their idols. Do you remember what Achan did? When they, when they attacked Jericho, he hid some stuff, he brought it home, he tucked it under his tent, they went out to fight the next day, and they lost. It's like, hey, well, what just happened? Yahweh promised that we'd be successful. Look, we're not successful. Something's going on. What's going on? And everybody starts weeping and wailing and saying, gosh, maybe this whole thing we're believing is not true. 
So Moshe comes back and starts wailing to Yahweh and said, gosh, man, gosh, Yahweh, you told us that if we did all this stuff, we came out here, we learned your ways, we were circumcised, we got your Ten Commandments, we got your covenant, that we'd be successful against our enemies. And look what you did. You won't even back us up. We just got slaughtered. And Yahweh says, hey, knock that off. I didn't do nothing about not keeping my side of this contract. Go back and read the contract. I told you that if you did what I said, you'd be successful. Just because you weren't successful, don't come back here and blame me. Why don't you go find out what you guys did? What? Somebody did something? Call a meeting. Call a meeting, draw lots. They pick the tribe, they pick the clan, they pick the family, they pick the, the man. The guy's name was Achan. He said, step up here. You better tell us what you did. And he said, I saw some stuff that looked pretty good. We, we went in to conquer Jericho. I saw... I mean, it, it was nice, shiny. It was a piece of, it was an artifact, you know? It was some, it was, it was some expensive robes and some gold and silver. I mean, what's the big deal? So I brought it home and I stuck it in my front yard, you know, buried it under my tent. And he said, why have you determined to be the troubler of Israel? Now your trouble has troubled you. Come on. And they brought him out, and I think it was his family and his animals and everybody, and all of Israel pelted him with stones until he died. And he always says, now, let me give you the battle plan for tomorrow. And they go out there and they successfully whip their enemies until they failed to regard Yahweh's words again. We talked about this one week before. At the beginning of the book of Judges, it says Judah was successful in attacking and conquering the people of the mountains. But then, oh gosh, the people in the valley had iron chariots. And so they couldn't conquer them. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> what does that mean they had iron chariots? What does Yahweh care about iron chariots? These guys got F-16s. <sighs> these guys got spy satellites. Oh, man, these guys got the atom bomb. Oh, man, these guys are the bankers of the world. <laughs> they got all the money. We can't fight against them. What does Yahweh care about those guys? Nothing. The word iron chariots, as we talked a few weeks ago, can be retranslated to mean astonishingly, surprisingly, their courage was drained out the way you'd open a tap on a bottle and drain out all the water. You see, they saw the iron chariots and their courage evacuated and they were left with nothing inside. Because they responded to what they saw rather than what Yahweh's words were. So last week we were talking about pay as compared to iron. Iron is what you see. It also has to do with ocular. It also has to do with occult. And it has to do with the people that are into the mystical divination, sorcery. And because Yahweh saw there was no sorcery in Israel or divination or perversion, they were successful. Balaam came and told Balak, hey, why don't you trick these guys and get them to get into the stuff that gave them the strength. And so they got into it. And they lost it. They blew it because they did the thing that Yahweh said not to do. So the pay is, listen to his words, which supersedes or trumps the occult, the ocular, what you see. But what you see is what you get. So there's all these different stories embedded in these letters. So where does that leave us here? So the people of the Vatican, thinking that this is the evidence that we've conquered the sun deity, we've conquered the heathen sun worshippers of the world, so they bring their obelisk back and, back and stick it in their front yard, and it's like, that's a symbol that the sun god conquered you. And if you look at what happened, sorry to the Catholics out there, but if you look at what happened with Constantine who became a Christian, he actually blended Mithra sun god worship with Judaism and the concept of the Messiah and invented Christianity. Uh-oh, it's not the story we were taught, but it's what happened, and the proof of it is the obelisk of the sun god stands in the front yard of the Vatican. Is that the symbol of us doing what Yahweh said? No. Why? Because we haven't regarded to his open mouth. Remember what Yeshua did in Matthew 5? In seeing the multitudes, he went up onto a mountain and he sat down. 
and he opened his mouth and he taught them. Why is that written there? You see, if you know how to read Hebrew, and he opened his mouth. Pays on. If you read it in English, it's like, oh, well, he went up there. And, when do you ever describe somebody and you say they opened their mouth? You don't say that. He went up on the mountain and he taught. and He went up on the mountain and he sat down and he opened his mouth. This suddenly takes on a whole nother meaning. He opened his mouth. Pays on. What did he open? On this chart, there's a line here, Matthew 5 and Matthew 6. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there's the kingdom of heaven. It follows the Mishkan pattern. As he taught, he gave them the Mishkan pattern embedded in the Beatitudes. The pay lines up, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see Elohim. They shall see Elohim, but the pay is a mouth. The iron's behind them, but the iron lined up with blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. You see, the iron has to do with the scales of justice, what goes around comes around, and pay has to do regarding his words. Blessed are those who regard his words, not walking by sight, but by walking by his words, for they shall see Elohim. How do you see Elohim? In his words. The veil was in front of you, and remember, if the veil is ripped open, you're looking right into the Zadi, which is the place of the Ark of the Covenant, with his words inside. It's all about his words. It's not about what we see. Sid Roth on It's Supernatural on the radio always has these people on talking about wonderful things they see. Maybe they're, maybe they're true. Maybe it really happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm saying how many of the people that have you ever heard on that show talk about regarding Yahweh's words? They talk about spiritual things that happen, supernatural things that happen. Lord, Lord, we did miracles in your name. We cast out demons. We raised the dead. We did all these great things. And Yeshua is going to say to all, whole bunch of people, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. The word iniquity is anomio in Greek. It means toilessness. It means those who haven't regarded my words. I've never known you. Whoever you thought you knew wasn't me. Why don't you go call the guy you thought you had a relationship with that you were casting out and doing wonderful miracles in his name and see if he can save you from the pit of hell you're about to be thrown into because I got nothing to do with you. It's like, it's the scariest verse of the Bible. Okay, I'm gonna, we're running out of time here. I'm going to read. Now, most of the time during these weeks, I'm going to get this thing off the page. One other thing, if you look at Lou White's book and um, Jim Staley, they talk about on the top of the church, there's these things, which are very similar to this. That's what a putz is, by the way. <laughs> Pezzotti is also the word for putz. It's the way, it's the way you pronounce it, or putza. It's also where we get the word pizza which means to scatter. And it's like, oh, what is a pizza? The pizza is this big round thing where you scatter the toppings all over it and you eat it with your mouth. And it looks like a bunch of flowers. So Pezzotti also has to do with like, you know, things flowering and all these things scattered about. But see, the, the thing that's hidden in there is that if we don't regard the things that came out of his open mouth, we get scattered and broken into crumbles like the toppings of a pizza. All these things are embedded. And you can look at Isaac's, Isaac Moseson's work, or you can look at all this other stuff, and you'll see, the more you see, the more you look at the dictionary, the more you see this stuff. Anyway, I'm going to take these things off. That's why certain people don't like to have the spires on the top of the church steeples. But that's, you know, a philosophical thing, which we're not going to go there. The word for ear or handle, remember we're talking about the eye and the eye and the ear. How do you watch and balance an ear? The word for ear is ayan, zion, nun. It also is a handle. Well, you could hold your head by the ears, you might say. But it also means to give ear, listen, or hearken. To balance, level, weigh carefully, tested, proved. Well, the other thing is that nun samic. Like on the past, it also means to test proof. It's the word for assay, A-S-S-A-Y, and essay. An essay exam is like, listen, we're not going to give you any help. It's not a true, false, it's not multiple choice. I'm going to give you an essay test. Write down everything you know. It's like, gosh, those are hard tests. Assay, you bring an ore in, and the assay office refines it and finds out how pure that element is, that gold or silver or whatever it might be. Nunsamic means the same thing. Ayin Zayin Nun means the same thing. It's where we get the word for belt or weapon or implement. So you could say, well, the belt that goes around you, remember, be gird, 
with the word of truth, right? Gird with truth. What goes around you? The belt. Well, so you have the police that have their belts. You have the, the cops. You have, you know, construction workers. But you also have, Yahweh says, he girt Israel around him like a belt. Batman had a belt. You know, the Joker said, wow, where do you get those toys? It's like, Yahweh had Israel as his belt. You know, like the champion wrestling belt with the big giant belt buckle. And Yahweh's going, man, it's Israel, yeah. It's like, we are supposed to be Yahweh's belt. Where he says, did you check this one out? Okay, you joker, check out this toy. And it's like, whoa. It's like, that's supposed to be the 12 tribes. Are we? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start just reading a few things here. Different verses. I'm just going to throw these out. We've only got five minutes left in this thing here. And there's too much. Here's, here's, and I'm going to read some of the stuff right out of the scripture and some of the stuff that I've translated because we don't have a whole lot of time. And from underneath, subliminally, the arrangement of, or the order unto reconstruction about how to build, like laying bricks, line upon line, properly, structurally sound. This is in Leviticus 24, verse 7. Solid, trustworthy, to pass inspection without fault. And so it came to be the depths of thought after careful deliberation in, e in order to bring forth a new sprouting of food. Remember as a wife unto Yahweh, a burnt offering wholly consumed, in reference to commemorate the uh, sacrifice uh, under Yahweh. This doesn't make any sense. What I'm trying to show you is that these are definitions of words that relate to other things here that I don't have time to go into, which says, uh, 24 verse 7, regarding the table of showbread, There will be two stacks, six in each stack, upon the pure table, frankincense upon each stack. And it's like, what? <laughs> I just read this other stuff, and yet you read it in English, it has to do with putting frankincense on the table? What does it got to do with anything? What I'm saying is if you know how to appropriate the meanings of these words from looking at the dictionary and looking at the meanings of the letters, you'll find that it's commandments hidden to Yahweh's people like the message inside the suitcase. And because the suitcase, it's like, there's frankincense and six loaves on the, uh, on the table of showbread. That's the holy scripture narrative. So we'll carry the story through time that says there's six loaves and two stacks on the table of showbread. And really what's inside of it is the message to say, if you want to be a, as a good wife unto Yahweh, it has to do with from underneath subliminally, cryptically embedded, the Mishkan pattern, the proper arrangement or the order, like the pattern behind the, the Beatitudes that even Yeshua was talking about on the mountain, unto reconstruction. Or the reason for it is in order to reconstruct in the future that which has gotten torn apart in the meanwhile, like laying bricks, line upon line, properly, structurally, sound and solid, one that will pass inspection. And so it came to be that after careful deliberation from the depths of thought, that's what we're talking about here, deeply pondering, in order to bring forth a new sprouting of food that has not been polluted and tainted and wrecked by Monsanto and the, the, the pirates of DNA that Len Horowitz in with the GMO foods we've been giving, that it's in reference to a commemoration of Yahweh's goodness and forgiveness and his special consideration of his people in spite of all we've done. Isaiah 29, 14. Behold, therefore, I will continue to perform more wonders against this people. That's the people that Israel has turned away from him. Wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of its wise men will be lost. The understanding of its sages will be concealed. Woe to them. We talked about this last week. Who try to hide in depths to, contri to conceal the counsel that comes from Yahweh. Who, in other words, those preachers or rabbis who have misappropriated what these words really mean. And their deeds are in darkness, and they say, ha, 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 who sees us, who knows us? The clerks, the clerics, the clergy, they say, nobody knows how to read except for us. Ha, ha, we can do whatever thing we want, nobody knows. On that day, the deaf will hear the words of the book, and from darkness and blackness, or from the intentional obscurity, the eyes of the blind people will see. That's what we're talking about doing here. I think this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 29. The meek will increase their joy. That's the word simcha or sameach. The meek, 
will increase their Sameach and Yahweh and the poor among the people will rejoice in the Kadosh Israel. And you could say, well, that will re rejoice in the Holy One of Israel is what it's translated. But it's like, no, the Kadosh things that have been given to Israel is also possibly interpretation. We should be rejoicing in seeing this stuff. This is the Kadosh stuff, the set apart, sacred, sanctified stuff set apart that not everybody else can mess with that he's had in these suitcases carried along on the winds of time for all these thousands of years and he's now making it available to us so we're upon a break here and what i want to do is just to read a few more things when we come back and then i promise i'll get into psalm 119 because what i want to show you is what i think what maybe david did hide or could have hide or it reads if you read the first word like a what's called an acronym right like swat special weapons and tactics what if you just read the first word, so it's an eight-sentence verse, all starting with letters out. Eight-sentence verse, or eight-word sentence, excuse me, all starting with the letter bet. An eight-word sentence, each word starts with the letter gimel, so forth and so on. Wouldn't that be a place that, that he could maybe hide it? It's a pretty easy place, but has anybody ever thought about that before? Has anybody ever thought that maybe reading just the first word of, that maybe he put it there? Anyway, we'll get on to that.